Lawrence Vanderpost is a man of many accomplishments. He's recognized throughout the Western world as a distinguished author and statesman. Perhaps he is most well known for his successful efforts to preserve the life and the culture of the Bushmen of the Kalahari. Vanderpost was born in 1906 in South Africa to a large and distinguished family. At the age of 20, he left South Africa to pursue a career as a journalist in London. During World War II and in the years after, Vanderpost served as a special envoy for Britain in the Far East and in Africa. In 1981, he was knighted for his many years of public services to the Queen. In this conversation, we hear how Vanderpost came to know C.G. Jung of Switzerland. He speaks of the value of Jung's discoveries for the evolution of the modern world. Before this, Vanderpost had expressed his appreciation for Jung and his psychology in two very extensive works. One, a feature-length film on Jung's life, which Vanderpost wrote and produced for the BBC, and the other, a poetic and candid biography of Jung, published in 1975. This conversation took place in the winter of 1978 in the living room of Sir Lawrence's home in Chelsea, where he lives with his wife, Ingerette Giffard, a noted Jungian analyst of London. I would like to hear the story of how you met C.G. Jung in the first place. Mm. Well, it's a, it's a very simple and yet a very complicated story because the odds against my meeting him uh, would have seemed insuperable uh, because whenever people had spoken to me about him in the past although I think I have a natural interest in what is called the field of psychology because of Freud and my experience of Freud and Jung's association with Freud I completely rejected Jung and I wasn't really interested and then I came back from about 11, 12 years of continuous war and I was still technically in the British Army and I just dropped my uniform in London and I went to Zurich where my wife happened to be working at the time with uh, Freddie Meyer and um, Tony Wolfe in particular and to a certain extent with Emma and C.G. Jung and then uh, they had one of these sort of parties they had for the Institute and I was asked to come along and I found myself put next to you mm. and that's how I met him and then um, he happened to be at that moment um, talking to some eminent Dutch scholar and they were talking about fire and the meaning of fire and this Dutch scholar said oh well of course it's just energy isn't it fire I've never forgotten the look on Jung's face, you know, because um, if anybody could just think of fire as energy, it was so remote. Of course it's that as well. And um, I started to join in there. And I told them about how when I'd been dropped into the jungles of Malaya, I discovered a very interesting primitive tribe called the Sakai who made fire in a completely different way. And Jung was immediately interested. He said, how do they make it? And I said, well, uh, it's very wet, it's always raining, so the Sakai will go about naked. They carry a little belt, leather belt, and at the end of this they have a 
block of wood, in the centre of which is a very deep cylinder, and the top of it is a kind of lid which has a rod attached to it, which fits exactly into the cylinder. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the rod, there's a very deep niche carved. And they have a little leather pouch full of dry moss, and they put the moss into the niche, and they put the cylinder into the, uh, the, at least they put the rod into the opening of the cylinder, and then they knock the two together. And then they pull it out, and the moss is on fire. And uh, I said to Jung that when I saw this, I had a man who was an engineer with me, and he turned to me and he said, My God, Colonel, the diesel engine. And that <laughs> was too much for Jung. And I heard him laugh. He roared with laughter, you know. And the primitive people already, out of the collective unconscious, had the diesel engine principle working, you know. And I think it was that laugh of his which got me. And then we spent, started talking immediately. Um, it's one, uh, it's the most extraordinary laugh that Jung had, you know. Uh, because I remember Olga Fleur de who founded Eranos. Uh, on the lakes of Ascona told me that very often when Jung was talking there and uh, they sat round, they had a great round table at Eranos uh, where I've sat myself when I lectured there and just above the table you had the main road from Italy to Switzerland and masses of cars going by and Jung would sit there after a lecture and they would have wine and he would, he would laugh and Olga said it was amazing the numbers of time. Strangers would come down from the road, stop their cars, and say, would you mind showing us who that was who laughed just now? His laugh had that kind of pri primordial quality of laughter. It was a laugh almost more of, um, of somebody who had been infected by the gods. Than, mm. you know, it was really quite infectious. You know, I'm very interested in the fact that he had um, important and deep relationship with uh, women. It's one of the most important things, my dear, in Jung. One must never, never think about Jung without remembering his love of and for women his love of the feminine in man as well as for the feminine in women and um, the service he performed for women and the enormous service which women performed for him. Uh, because I think myself that in a scientific way, completely scientific way, Jung did uh, for the world what Dante did in a poetic way. Mm. But um, whereas Dante was inspired by a beautiful feminine face, the face of Beatrice, the face of a girl he just saw in the streets of Florence, and which led him from then on right through his life, uh, Jung uh, was had the shattering originality to be inspired uh, by what you might call the ugly face of womankind. Mm. Uh, Jung had an instinct that what was wrong with life, what made life tear apart, made it incomplete, was because the feminine was rejected. And even in his very, very first book, which he called the psychology of the unconscious. I think it's now called Roots of the Unconscious, which led to his break with Freud. Because um, if there's one thing that Freud uh, didn't have conspicuously in his makeup, it was a sense of the importance of the feminine. I mean, Freud was very much an Old Testament phenomenon. He was a prophet. He was a very great man. I'm not saying this to belittle him, but merely to understand him. He was a very great person, a very great pioneer to whom we owe a lot. But he was an Old Testament uh, phenomenon, I, and I think more of Jung as a New Testament phenomenon. But um, 
uh, Jung had the, this sense of the rejected feminine enormously. Uh, when you go back into his life, and particularly if you go into the case histories which he's left behind in the Burgholtzi, which I've done, it's in very, very interesting to me how most of the cases that really gripped him were the cases of women who had gone, as they called it then, insane. And there was this famous case of this woman, I think her name was Babette, uh, who in the Burkholzli Hospital who'd been there for donkey's years, the one who said, you know, Naples and I, between us, must supply the world with spaghetti. And everybody said, my God, she's crazy. Do you see? She's crazy. What is she talking about? But to Jung, um, it was very significant because he saw in this a law of compensation that she was trying to put herself into an important role because she was feeling neglected. Mm. She'd lost her identity. And he learned an enormous amount from this old lady. And when Freud visited Jung in Zurich for the first time, Jung took Freud to see this old lady. And Freud said to Jung afterwards, yes, I can see that she's an interesting case, but isn't she a hideous old lady? I would hate to spend my time with her. And to Jung, this was a, quite a shock, he told me. It nearly bowled him over because he'd never thought of her in those terms. That's what I mean, that he could follow, not like Dante, the outward beauty and face of womankind as most men do but he could follow the inner face the averted the rejected face of women and so it was not surprising that when he came across the uh, papers in the case of this extraordinary Miss Miller who had these fantasies that he could follow her in her fantasies and that was his first feminine guide was a, a deranged feminine spirit driven insane driven mad by a world of men rejected by a masculine dominated world mm. now Jung worked in this rejected feminine world of the unconscious for years people came to him he was particularly successful with women patients and one person came into his life very early on because he's already with Jung and Emma Jung at the famous conference in Vienna where they are all photographed together and that is Tony Wolf. Now, um, uh, Tony Wolf, whatever the diagnosis was, it was a very serious diagnosis. A lot of people who knew her said that they despaired of her ever recovering from whatever a psychological disturbance was. Mm. I think one must accept that it was profound enough to fit uh, the rare exceptional spirit that she was, because in a sense, the rarer, the more exceptional the spirit, the deeper the psychological suffering. And Jung managed to bring her out of this, so that by the time of the famous Vienna conference, she was already an integrated working personality and to me that photograph is very moving because the one who looks young as if she's just been born is Tony Wolf. to take it down into the level where it belongs you see that all the time that Jung was working with the rejected feminine he was in a sense working by projection to use the term which he coined and because he was dealing with the feminine through the lives of the rejected feminine and others, an immense charge was building up in himself. And that time when he let himself go, and when he landed deep down in what he came to call the collective unconscious, all this rejected feminine in himself confronted him. And I think uh, this becomes very, very clear in that dream which he tells in dreams, memories and reflections. It's a dream 
which in which Jung again goes down and he finds somebody whom he thinks is the prophet Elijah sitting there and there's a great snake and there's a young girl whom he thinks is Salome who's blind and Jung in dreams, memories and reflections to my amazement Jung deals in such detail with all his other dreams he says oh well he said you know the old man the sage and the young girl it's a, it's a frequent theme you find it in Lao Tse and you find it in myths and legends and, and that's all there is about it well that wasn't what all, what all there is about it I think this is the moment of Jung's greatest psychological peril hmm. he's confronted with the fact that that like the whole of mankind, he himself, that his anima, his soul, in this aspect is blind. What happens in this period? Uh, this is the time when Tony Wolf took over. Mm. This is the time Tony Wolf was not blind. She'd been in this world before. She was the only one who knew it. And she took over from Salome and she conducted in this unfamiliar, terrifying underground of the collective unconscious she was Jung's guide to such an extent that she lived with him and she took over the whole of the burden and of course the tensions caused by that in Zurich and in the family must have been tremendous but it was done quite openly, lived out quite openly and I don't think that if it had not been for Tony Wolf, that Jung really could have survived and could have done the work on the collective unconscious in the manner that he did it, that we all owe it. This is a debt that we owe Tony Wolf, and the only way to repay, uh, repay it to somebody who's dead is to, is to talk about it and to give it decent recognition. Mm. And... Um, in a sense, uh, that's what women have had to do throughout history. They've, in a sense, they've had to train their own men, as it were, to, to become responsible for their own feminine selves and to see not only the external, but the inner side of w women. And Jung himself had the greatness to prepare the reflection of himself, because that was what Tony Wolfe was. The, and what these rejected women were, to train himself for this moment so that he would have an instrument at his side to complete the work which men and women have to do between them on earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very... Um, uh, uh, that, to me, is one of the most important accomplishments of Jung, which led uh, to this discovery, then, of the, um, the masculine in the feminine of the animus and the anima and that for the first time on earth now instead of men being just a two-sum or being a three-sum we're a foursome we're so much stronger the square is there the masculine within the feminine and the feminine within the man there are four and therefore I think it makes the relationships between men and women much more difficult because they're more complex but also makes them more meaningful and the potential infinitely greater. And to me, perhaps one of the most moving things of all is that Mrs. Jung, Emma Jung, said to a close friend of mine just before she died that she had never ceased to be grateful in her life for Tony Wolf, because Tony Wolf was able to do for her husband something that she could not have done. Jung wrote. I cannot define for you what God is. I cannot tell you even that God is. But what I can say is that all my work has scientifically proved that the pattern of God exists in every man and that this pattern has at its disposal the greatest transforming energies of which mankind is capable. Thank mm -hmm. you.